Scriptures today are from John chapter 4, and I've, I've selected, it's a rather long story. It's, it's actually one of the longer interactions that Jesus has with one person, uh, the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. Uh, but So I've made some selections so it make it a little bit uh, more streamlined for our purposes. From John chapter 4, starting with verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And later the woman will say, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. And just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman. Then leaving her water jar, the, men went back to, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Father, speak to our hearts today, I pray, that we might know what you would have us to know from your scriptures, and that you will be honored in not only the way we hear them, but the way we uh, apply them in our lives. Lord, inspire us through your spirit to be the people you want us to be, and transform us to be more like Christ, I pray in Jesus' name, for his glory. Amen. When I was in high school, one of the hot-button topics of the day was the discussion about the Equal Rights Amendment, which was passed by Congress in 1971 and sent to the states for ratification. And that amendment said, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States by any state on account of sex. The 1970s were marked by bitter debates about this amendment and who favored it and those who did not favor it. Those who did not favor it were led by Phyllis Shafley and other conservative women, and those who favored the amendment were led by a group called the National Organization of Women, or NOW. Arguments about this constitutional amendment included, we don't need it because the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination based on sex as well as race does, as well as it does race, and so we don't need it. Another argument was, it'll take away some of the protections that working women have Uh, that will maybe be worse for working women than they were before. And another argument was it will force women to to, to register for the draft uh, or be eligible for the draft, which was a big thing during that time. The draft was in effect still during the Vietnam War and uh, women being forcibly, you know, impressed into military service was a concern some people had. And then some of the arguments were, were... not, didn't seem so, so severe, like we would be forced to use the same bathrooms was one of the arguments that people had. Seems like that argument still comes around. The, AR, the ERA failed to be ratified by, I think it was just one state, uh, and it had to be done, and they actually extended the deadline to 1979, but as one or two states, it fell short of required, they required 38 states. I also remember during this time, one of the commercials on TV was, you've come a long way, baby. Does anybody remember that? Yeah. It was a Virginia Slims commercial, and it was touting the progress women had made uh, up to that point. At, at least they had a cigarette just for them now, apparently. It was, it was, that was one of the, you know, finally there's a cigarette meant, meant to bring cancer to women, too. You know. <laughs> so that was one of the long ways that we came. The fact is, women have come a long way. They have come a long way, but... Some would say that they have a long way to go still, and both of those statements are true. Equal pay for equal work is still not completely a reality in the workplace, and the so-called glass ceiling has maybe cracked somewhat, but it hasn't broken completely. And even in the church, and maybe sometimes especially in the church, we have a long way to go. I have, I have a female colleague from uh, seminary who shared some stories with me of roadblocks and, and some of the animosity that she has received in following her calling. She, she's a pastor in Cleveland, Tennessee. And uh, when we were going through school together, it was not uncommon for those of us who were seminary students to be asked to speak at our presbytery's worship service. And she was asked to speak for her like I was at mine too. 
for her Presbytery worship service down in Tennessee, and the difference was uh, I was patted on the back and, and encouraged, and she was told, we're going to have to get someone else to, to preach this service because the local church session, which is hosting the Presbytery, said they would all resign and leave the church if you spoke because you're a woman. So, and this is from a church who, from our denomination, which boasts that we were the first woman, the uh, first Presbytery, or first uh, church actually, to ordinate, ordain a woman west of the Appalachian Mountains. So, and yet that's the response she felt with. She also had to deal with other weird things too, like wh what she wears. Uh, she got called up on the carpet for her clothing when she spoke at, at our seminary classes. Uh, none of us guys did, you know. Uh, but you know what. It, it, she was going to be judged. The guy was telling her, by, you know, women judge women how they dress. You know, they give up on guys a long time ago. You know, <laughs> they, they've given up on trying to get us dressed. But women will judge each other on how they're dressed. And so she, she has to wear a robe to preach on Sunday mornings, something that I've told people from the very beginning I'm not going to do uh, for a vari variety of personal and theological reasons I won't do. But she has to because she's a woman. So, there's things that need to be changed. And last Sunday, I told you that John Ortberg said in his book, uh, Who is This Man?, that sometimes Jesus' teachings have met more resistance inside the church than they have outside the church. And unfortunately, this is all too true. But I have this hope, and that is that Jesus is not done with us yet. He is still working to make differences in our lives. And then the sermon series, we're going to look at the historical impact of Jesus upon the world. And although we have a long way to go, we would have been such a worse situation had it not been for the effect that Jesus has had on this world. One of the ways that Jesus revolutionized the world and still doing it through those of us who follow him is the way he received women. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 to 29, the Apostle Paul would say these words that have kind of the theme of this series. You are... Uh, all sons are children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ Jesus, and all who were have clothed yourself with Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, he goes on to say, and heirs according to the promise. Now, this was remarkable when he said this because the same women, male and female, there's no male or female, women, you are heirs. And this is a time when women did not inherit things. You are heirs of the promise, along with everybody else. This passage has been called the first statement of equality of rights in human literature. On the first Sunday that we had this, this series, I pointed out that when Jesus began his ministry, it was not uncommon in the Greek and Roman world for children to be treated like disposable items. They would simply take them out and put them on the hillside or on the, on the dump, and just leave the babies there that they didn't want. And one of the main reasons why a baby was exposed to the elements like this was because they were a girl instead of a boy. Women were castaway people in a world of Greece in Rome when Jesus came. Now, uh, Jesus, the Jewish people weren't all that way. Some were, but they, they did have a different view of women. But it wasn't until Jesus came that that view changed the rest of the world, too, the, the, non, the pagan world, the Roman world, the Greek world, too. People who were viewed as worthless, people who were treated like they didn't matter, that's what they were before. People who were not considered people at all, they, they were just property. But Jesus ignored all that and changed it. And as a result of the way their cultures viewed women, there was uh, some problems in the world that Jesus came into. There was a huge shortage of women in the Greco-Roman world. There was about 140 men for every 100 women because people were disposing of the babies. In fact, here's a letter that an archaeologist found written by a first century man to his pregnant wife, and it illustrates it well. He says, I ask and beg of you to take good care of our baby son. If you are delivered of a child before I come home, if it is a boy, keep it. If a girl, discard it. You have sent my word you sent me word, don't forget you. How could I forget you? Do not worry. And you know, the loving little remarks at the end there are just kind of starkly, you know, uh, set up against the discarded. And that's how the world was. The law of Rome required a father to raise all healthy male babies, but it only required them to raise the firstborn female baby. 
This is the world Jesus came into. One person wrote in the third century before Christ, everyone raises a son, even if he's poor, but he exposes, or I could say disposes, a daughter, even if he's rich. The problem of not valuing a life because it's female didn't end in Bible times. I mean, in 1990, a famous essay was written that there's more than 100 million women missing in our world today, and specifically they're talking about China, India, and other places like that. Having visited China, I'm familiar with the, the rule they have, and it, you know, in a country that's got that many billions of people, you can understand why they would pass a law saying you can only have one child. But if you can only have one child, what kind of child are you going to want to have? to carry on your name. You see what I'm saying? And so today, a, a recent study has found that in Asia, th this was a study uh, called Unnatural Selection, they found that in Asia alone, there's 163 million more males than females. As a result, rich families cannot find brides for their sons, so poor families are more likely to sell their daughters, which has led to an increase in trafficking and marriages of girls as young as 11. Yeah. And this is the, this is modern world we're talking about. So it's, we've got a lot of changes in the world that they need to make, but change is possible. We've seen the trend of, set, of treating females as property has been reversed before, and it was done because of Jesus Christ, and that's what I want to talk about today. Women in Jesus' time were expected to stay at home. They did not travel with men. Respectable women did not go to the, the Greek plays in, in public. Uh, the kind of women who would be there would be lower uh, reputation, if you know what I'm saying. But women did not travel, and they didn't come out in the daytime. They, they changed that with Jesus. If you read the Bible, the Gospels will tell you that there was a group of women who traveled everywhere they went. Uh, some of them were moms of some of the, of the disciples. Uh, and there were people like Joanna and Susanna, and uh, these, these ladies travel with them. And we are even told that they actually took care financially. You know, they kind of funded the ministry of Jesus, if you will. One of them was actually the wife of a head of the household for King Herod. And so she had some resources. And she was funding the ministry of Jesus and his disciples so they could continue this, this traveling ministry they had. So that must have shocked the world. Women traveling with these guys, what they must have thought. Not all Jewish people were, were uh, crazy about women being treated this way. Uh, one rabbi said it's better that the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, be burned than taught to a woman. But most Jews, however, that Jesus grew up with, believed that a woman, as well as a man, fully bore the image of God and therefore would treat them as, a, as differently than what the Romans and Greeks were doing. And Jesus took that and amplified it and, and took it to the world. His love and compassion attracted men and women of all walks of life in all stations in life. A famous pastor and martyr of the Lutheran background in, in Hitler's Germany, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, wrote, Jesus gave women human dignity. Prior to Jesus, women were regarded as inferior beings, religiously speaking. In ancient Greece, laws about women were basically laws about property. If someone abused a woman, the husband or father would be given compensation. So if, if the woman was taken advantage of, then, you know, I would give you, as her husband, the money for the penalty. It's like she's your car, and somebody ran into your car, and you pay me because I'm the owner for the damage done to my car. The woman had no rights, really, in this at all. She was considered like a piece of property. And in Rome, a woman lived under the life or death power of the head of the family. The father, the, the head of the family, the father figure, could literally say, kill her, and that would be done. She would have, you know, he had that right over her. And when they talked about giving your hand in marriage, literally, that was, in Rome, that meant I'm giving this man now the control to decide whether she lives or dies. I'm giving that kind of power to someone else. And so we still say giving your hand, but uh, I hope we don't think that anymore. Following Jesus was a radical departure because now God had the ultimate authority over people. God is what determined our value, not the person, the man in their life, 
It was God's value that mattered now. In the Roman world, a girl could not be adopted. She could not become an heir. Jesus' followers, however, understood that there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave or free, but all are children of God in Christ Jesus. And we men and women are adopted into God's family through Christ and joint heirs with him. That's a radical change in how the world viewed women. You know, they were, now they're a joint heir with Christ. In Rome, a widow was fined if she didn't get married again within two years because they were considered a danger and a drag on the economy and on the state to have a, all these widows roaming around there. That all changed when Jesus said to John from the cross, Behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. Take care of my mom. And so Christians from that point on would remember Jesus and his words on the cross, and they say that taking care of widows, valuing, that, that's important. In fact, James, Jesus' brother, would write in his, the book of James that care of widows and orphans is what true religion is all about. Those least of these people, those discardable people, are what really matters, James would say. That's where we find what true religion is all about. If you really love Jesus, you will love those people he loved. John chapter 4, this is where we had that story of the woman coming to the well, the Samaritan woman. And I read it for you earlier, so I won't read it again. But I want to, to emphasize the fact that when the disciples come back, what, did they, what were they surprised about? Not that he was talking to a Samaritan, although that would have been shocking. You know, Samaritans were considered unclean. There were people in, in Jerusalem who would go all the way around Samaria rather than go through it, because if they went through it, they would be considered unclean, and they'd have to go through ritual cleansing before they could go anywhere or do anything. And that's how they viewed Samaritans. But they were not shocked that he was talking to a Samaritan. They were shocked that he was talking to a woman, who was even worse, apparently, on the totem pole of society. And this woman had, had not just one, but five husbands, he said. And you're not even married to the one you're living with. He told her everything about her that, that there was to know. And, and what this told us about this woman is this is a woman who had been rejected over and over again by people. And was considered, maybe she can consider herself worthless and of no value. And Jesus talked to her. She obviously was an intelligent woman. If you read the whole discourse in John chapter 4, she was intelligent. He, she knew her theology. She started trying to debate him about theology, but he just cut right through it and said, let's talk about what really matters. You need a Savior. He's standing right before you. And it says, I like that little piece that says she left her water jar and went, to town, went back to town to tell everybody. You know, she came there for water. You know, it, it, you know I'm, I'm getting to that age where I will walk into a room and I'll forget while I'm there. But I think that the, the whole point that she walked there for water and that she was so excited, she left the water jar to go tell everybody. And she said, come see a man who told me everything I did. She, was, she couldn't stop talking about this man. And we're told that many people came to be Christians because of her testimony. She was excited because she had met a, a man like, unlike any man she'd ever met before who treated her as someone who mattered. The modern joke says a CEO was traveling with his wife and stopped for gas. And when he came out of the station, he saw her at the gas pumps talking to the service station attendant. And he asked her later on, why were you talking to the service station attendant? She said, well, we used to date. And he, he kind of smugly laughed and said, huh. Well, I bet you're glad you're married to the CEO instead of a service station attendant. She said, no, what I was thinking was if I'd married him, he'd be a CEO and you'd be a service station attendant. <laughs> and as funny as that is, the problem with this joke is why can't she be the CEO? You know, that's, that's what John Orberg says. Why, why isn't the story about her being the CEO? Another joke about men and women is that a man and his wife were at a marriage weekend, and the instructor says, it's very important for you husbands and wives to know things that are important to each other. And so he asked the man, can you name and describe your wife's favorite flower? And the husband leaned over to his wife and said, it's Betty Crocker's gold medal, isn't it? <laughs> That's a joke from the 50s, you know. In many homes today, though, uh, you know, and this is when I, was, when I was growing up. My mom was in the kitchen uh, 
busily preparing the meals, and we were sitting down to the latest football game in the living room, all the guys watching TV. Or if we're, even, if we're a little bit more motivated, we're out at the grill, you know, hanging around the grill while the women are in the kitchen doing everything. And that reminds me of the story. By the way, we're going to try to change that at this Thanksgiving dinner. I, that, you'll hear announcements about that later. I'm, we're going to change that women in the kitchen thing and men at the football game. Thank you. I didn't say I'm going to change it at home. We're going to change it here. <laughs> Don't get your hopes up, Vicky. <laughs> but it reminded me of the story of Mary and Martha. You know the story in the Bible of Mary and Martha, and uh, Jesus was at their home in Bethany. They were, also, they were the sisters to the, uh, the their brother was Lazarus. You remember that story also. But this story about Mary and Martha was that, that they were at his, they were, he was visiting their home, and Martha was busy working, 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 and, and she came in and says, Lord, you know, Mary's sitting right at his feet and not doing anything, and Martha says, Lord, you know, I've got so much to do. Make her come help me. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen the thing that matters. Few things are needful. Few things really are important, and Mary has chosen that and most important thing, and I'm not going to take it away from her. Now, what I never had thought of about that story is usually, usually it's about women and, and busyness, and you've got to take time for Jesus and stuff like that. But it may be even deeper than that, because it says Mary was fit, sitting at the feet of Jesus, and that's the same expression used throughout the Bible, especially like when Paul discusses being a disciple of, of Gamaliel. He said, I learned at the feet of, of Gamaliel. And so basically Jesus was saying, I welcome her to be, I welcome women to be a disciple as well as men. I welcome her to, to this following me and learning from me, just like I do the other guys. So being a disciple wasn't just for men. Jesus invited women to his, be his disciples too, and that made him unusual in his day. And one day when he was teaching, a woman called out and said, blessed is your mother who, who gave you birth and nursed you. And, you know, that was considered the, the epitome of, of honor for women in that day was to just give birth. You know, that's your job and that's, you know. And Jesus said, no. Rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. So he said, there is something more important. There's a higher calling, and that is to follow me and do the will of God. The importance of women in Jesus' ministry can't be overestimated. Consider the fact that it was women who followed Jesus to the cross when the men got scared and ran. And, and all four Gospels say it was the women who went to the tomb first on that first Easter morning and, and were the first witnesses to the resurrection. Even though the testimony of women in that day was generally disregarded and, and uh, theologians will point out that if you were writing this, making this stuff up, you would never have picked women in that day to be the first ones. You would have had Peter or somebody significant going in to do it. But it was women who did it. And the reason why the gospel say that is because it's what happened. And when they got back, they were women. And they said, guess what? We just saw, you know, we just saw the risen Lord. And the disciples didn't believe him. It says in the, in the gospel of Luke, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. But in the years after the resurrection, as the church began to grow and spread across the Roman Empire, it seems clear from, from biblical and archaeological evidence that women had a significant role in the early church. And roughly half of the households that Paul mentions in his letters that form a foundation for their churches were headed by a woman. Women found in Christ a new value and a new community that they could devote their lives to. Now, we have a long way to go to valuing women the way Jesus did. The treatment of women in China and India and even here in the United States is evidenced by the, uh, the news lately. Um, the, the, all the, the ways women have been treated like objects or things that didn't matter shows that the world still needs to come to the well and meet this man, Jesus Christ, and be changed by him like that woman was. We still have a long way to go, but I want you to know that Christ is still transforming the world, and he works through you and me to do that. In India, there's a Christian ministry called As Our Own, and sex trafficking is very big in India, and these guys have gone alongside and rescued girls who were orphaned and taken them away from that life to raise them as their own. Why would they do that? It's because they feel that's what Jesus would have them do. Jesus is still making a difference in our world today. And the whole point of the sermon series is to, to show you 
the impact that Jesus has had on the world and inspire us to remember that we are still, as the body of Christ, called to make that difference. We are still called to be the light in this world, to let our light so shine that others will see the things that we do and will give glory to our Father in heaven. That's why we're talking about these things. In the world where Jesus was born, the abuse the abuse of enslaved, illiterate girl was common, girls was commonplace. It wasn't frowned upon it at all by society and law, but with the Church of Jesus Christ, suddenly those things began to change, and disposing of girls at birth was outlawed. And I said incorrectly a few weeks ago, uh, it was outlawed in 400 AD. It wasn't before Christ, but 400 years later, an emperor outlawed because of Christianity. He outlawed the disposal of children. So... The world began to see women and and children differently. Now, with all the recent political clashes, some have said that that perhaps the push has gone too far, and that now we're going. To, some people say we're going to see the year of the man. I want us to see the year of the Christian, and I want you to remember Jesus, who said, "I tell you the truth: whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did for me." And how we treat the least of these, including women and all those others we've been talking about, is how we show we love Jesus. So, remember that the most great commandment of all, Jesus said, was to love God with all of our heart. And secondly, like it, he said, is to love our neighbor as ourselves. To be known by our love. That's what Christ calls us to do. And so, may you love the least of these. And when you do so, may you remember that you are loving Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, help us to realize that even today, uh, you are making a difference in this world. You're changing things even now as you change our hearts, our lives. And then, Father, I pray that your spirit will continue the work in us that you've been doing for these 2,000 years, that we might be a, a, a salt in this world that will bring uh, that will bring. Uh, some life and we'll, we'll bring preservation and, and we'll bring uh, all the things that are missing here uh, to this bland world that we live in and that you will help us be light in a place that seems so dark sometimes. And Lord, just shine through us so that others might see you and give you glory, we pray. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.